We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. On this most solemn day, as we consider the God of the universe becoming a man and dying for our sins. The grace of God is above and beyond all that we could ask or think. In your bulletin today, you will find a sheet for taking notes. You will also find the prayer requests that would have been passed out on Wednesday evening, but we give them to you now. And we trust that you will take those home with you and that you will pray for those who are having great difficulties at this time. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Let's stand to sing the doxology. thank you that you are the living and true God. You are the God who has provided for us through your Son, the one who shed his blood for our sins, who was buried and rose again. Father, we pray for your blessings on this service of worship, that our hearts might be filled with worship, that we might glorify Jesus Christ in the way that we think, our attitudes, our motives, our speech, our actions. Father, we pray that Jesus Christ would indeed be glorified in all that is done here this day. For this is the day we remember what he did for us when he died for our sins and took our place and bore our punishment on Calvary's cross. How we thank you for him and pray for your blessings upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing and take your hymnals and turn to number 311. Hallelujah, what a Savior, number 311. Oh, 
scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah, a great prophetic passage describing for us the death of our Lord Jesus Christ 800 years before he was born. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Hymn number 306, you remain seated. Number 306, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. 306. Yeah. 
second scripture is from Psalm 22. Again, another of the very great messianic psalms that foretells the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be reading the entire psalm, verses 1 through 31. <clears throat> to the chief musician, upon Ayelet Shachar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O oh, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. <laughs> they shoot out the lip and shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord. O oh, my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all ye, seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Amen. 
Again, here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 305, 305, Jesus Paid It All, number 305. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that though sin had left a crimson stain, Jesus washed it white as snow. We come to you, Father, humbly confessing our sins. For it is our sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. 
It is our sins that cause the crown of thorns to be rammed down upon his head and blood to flow down. It is our sins that cause him to be beaten with the cat of nine tails until his back was raw and bleeding. It was our sins that nailed each nail into his hands and into his feet. It was our sins for which he suffered in agony. It was our sins that brought about the piercing of his side with a Roman spear. It was our sins that put him to death, a death that we should have had to have died. It was our sins that put him in the grave. It was our sins that caused him for three days and three nights to suffer the agony and the flames of hell. We have sinned. We humbly confess that to you. We pray, Father, that if there is some sin in our life which we have not confessed, some sin in our life from which we have not repented, that you will bring that sin to our attention. Even in the quietness of this moment, that you would remind us that we might confess it to you. For you have promised in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we confess those sins now. Thank you, Father, for your word is true and your promises are yea and amen. And we know, because your word declares it, that as we have confessed our sins, you have both forgiven and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We gather together today to thank you that you've made that forgiveness possible through the blood of your Son. We gather to thank you for not only giving us biological life, but giving us new life in Christ, eternal life that goes on when this mortal body passes away and crumbles to dust, a life with our Savior in heaven, who is even now preparing a place for us, who has promised to come again and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And how we thank you that he told us the way. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so, Father, we thank you that he is our Lord and our Savior. And that Calvary proves it to us, and the resurrection guarantees it for us. Father, as we continue with this service, cause our hearts to be in line with your heart, our thoughts to be upon Christ, our joy to be that of your Holy Spirit, and in all things that we might give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn to number 312. Calvary covers it all, number 312, and we'll stand to sing.
up here that have the order of service in them, and the next portion of scripture which we'll be reading is John chapter 19, I'll be reading verses 16 through 42, John chapter 19, verses 16 through 42, God's word for his people, then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. For they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. 
This title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They therefore said among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst! Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished! And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. <clears throat> and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with a spice, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day. For the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word once again. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 335, Cross of Jesus, Cross of Sorrow.
number 335. You may remain seated. Scripture reading now comes to us from the book of Revelation, where we find not merely the Lamb of God who is slain, but we find the risen Lamb, the one who had been slain but who now stands, the one who will come someday and judge the earth, the one who's provided us with our salvation. Revelation chapter 5. God's word for his people. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the be four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, 
And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen! And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Here again ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 320, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We'll stand to sing 320.
seated. My glory, all the cross. Hanging upon a tree. Our scripture today is taken from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It's an important passage because the Apostle Paul not only explains the cross, but he explains faith. He explains the covenant promises to Abraham. He explains why it is so foolish not to believe and obey the truth. Why it is so foolish because you cannot have the Spirit of God by keeping the law. You cannot please God by keeping the law. You cannot be justified by keeping the law because the law only brings a curse. And that's why Jesus had to be crucified as Paul closes that passage in verse 13. I'm going to read those 13 verses to you because they are essential for us to understand what Jesus did. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Amen. Again, here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Hanging on a tree means many different things to different people. If you ask the question, what comes to your mind when you think of hanging on a tree? You'll get different answers. Let me give you some illustrations. A visit to the Jew, to the zoo, thinks about monkeys. What do you think about when you think about hanging on the tree? You ask any visitor to the zoo and they'll tell you monkeys. If you ask that question to a cowboy, he probably thinks about the cattle rustlers and what he would like to do with them, hang them on a tree. An orchard worker probably thinks about apples and oranges when he thinks of things hanging on a tree. If you ask that question to a pioneer woman back in the early 1800s, she'd probably be thinking about hanging out her laundry. At Christmas time, all the children will think about hanging Christmas tree ornaments. A grammar teacher perhaps thinks about dangling participles and diagramming sentences, hanging something on a tree. You see, the context makes all the difference. But if you ask a Christian on this day, marking the death of Christ, 
What do you think of when you think of hanging on a tree? The answer will always be the Lord Jesus. In our text for today, the tree is, of course, the cross of Calvary. And in this passage, Paul quotes a very significant Old Testament prophecy in the context of a major section dealing with capital punishment. Hanging on a tree. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 23. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, listen, young people, be glad you're not living under the law. A stubborn and rebellious son will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that, when they have chastened him, they've actually spanked him, will not listen to them, not hearken to them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out into the elders of his city and to the gates of his place. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Kids, at least a teenager by this point. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear, shall hear and fear. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, he shall be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, for an inheritance. Fascinating context. That, of course, is one of the principal passages in the Old Testament dealing with capital punishment for those who have committed heinous crimes. It's interesting to see that it's immediately preceded by the punishment of a rebellious son. Because that's such a contrast with our Lord Jesus. Jesus was a son who was in perfect obedience to the Father. Paul makes a point of this in speaking of the cross. The obedience of Christ, not his disobedience, but the obedience of Christ when he gets hanged on the tree, the last two verses of that section. Philippians 2.8 And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The obedient son is the one being put to death. Romans chapter 5, verse 19, Paul speaks of it again. He says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The obedient son is the one who's put to death. Hebrews 5, 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. When we look at the tree upon which Jesus was hanged, we see him not as the disobedient son. We are the disobedient sons. We see him as the obedient son taking the place of those whom now, as according to the book of Hebrews, he delights to call his brothers. Can you imagine being the big brother the little brother does something horrible. The parents are about to discipline the little brother and you say, I'll take it for him. You've done nothing wrong, but you let the little brother go and the big brother takes it. That's what Jesus did for us, except it wasn't just a beating. It wasn't just a crown of thorns. It wasn't just nails in the palms of his hands and in his feet. It was the death of the cross. The shame, the ridicule, the humiliation, the nakedness, the bleeding, the suffering. In Philippians, we find that obedient son in the tree of Calvary in the context of our imitation of Christ. That first verse that I read has a context around it. The context is our imitation of Christ. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Humility precedes exaltation. Verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now the application the tree, the obedience, the death, and now the application. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The second verse that we read was Romans chapter 5, verse 8. In Romans, we find the obedient son and the tree of Calvary in the context of many of the principal doctrines of Scripture. We find it in the context of election, salvation, justification by faith, peace with God, access to God by grace, joy in the guarantee of future hope in spite of life trials, confidence in the love of God, the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ for our sins, justification by blood, salvation from the wrath to come, reconciliation with God, forgiveness from sin, freedom from the law which Christ fulfilled by his death, the gift of salvation, and the gift of imputation of righteousness. And all of that in the context of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 19, being the one who was the obedient son. Whereas by many, one man's disobedience, many were made righteous, made sinners, excuse me. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. He was the innocent son. He was not the guilty son. Back in verse 7, Paul writes, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The righteous son died for the children who were unrighteous. He took their place. They disobeyed. They ran out in the front of the traffic. The older son ran out, grabbed the little one, threw him aside, and took the truck. The wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. Somebody had to pay the penalty in hell. Jesus says, I love my little brothers and sisters. I'll die for them. Dear people, he did that for you and for me. The obedient son and the tree of Calvary. In Hebrews, we find in that third verse that we read just a moment ago, we find the obedience of the son on the tree of Calvary in the context of the high priesthood of Christ making the final and perfect offering for our sins once and for all. We see it in the context of the faithful and powerful prayers of God the Son on our behalf. We see it in the context of prayers, which the Father always answers with a yes answer. And we see the tree of Calvary in the obedience of the Son, which guarantees our eternal salvation. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may both offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also... Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, 
Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. It's a quotation out of Psalm 2. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that is able to save him from death, and was heard, in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and became perfect, being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Christ was the obedient son who took the curse of the law upon himself for all of us who were disobedient sons that he might bring us to glory. Hebrews 2.10 For it became him who, for whom all things are, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. You know, the Bible begins with the tree of life in Genesis. The Bible ends with the tree of life appearing again in Revelation. Man was restricted from eating the tree of life because of the fall. Adam and Eve ate of something that was hanging on a tree. They ate of the fruit of the garden, but a particularly the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and were driven from the garden. Genesis 2.9 out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees there. They chose the wrong one. The Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Life and death. Every day, folks, we make choices that either bring us more life or bring us closer to death. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave to her husband also, and he did eat. They hide themselves when they find they're naked. And the Lord, walking in the cool of the garden, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And God speaks to Adam and he says, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The Bible begins with a tree, two trees, a tree of life and literally a tree of death. As we move through scripture, God provides another tree another tree of death to get us back to the tree of life hanging on a tree 
And so God in his mercy and grace provided another tree to bridge the gap from the tree of life in the beginning to the tree of life in the end. Jesus was nailed to the tree because it was from a tree that Adam and Eve ate the fruit and plunged us all into sin and death and hell. Jesus stood in the gap as he hung between heaven and earth. We sang about it a moment ago in that hymn that speaks of the cross standing between us in an open grave to guard the way. He provided the shield from the flames designed for sinners. He poured out his precious blood in death to once again provide access to the tree of life in the heavenly garden of God. Revelation 22. In the midst of the street of it on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The tree of life was lost by a tree of death. The tree of life was regained by a tree of death. That's why Paul says that he glories in the cross of Christ, the tree upon which our Lord bore our sins. Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Amen. And that's our closing hymn for today. In the cross of Christ I glory. Number 300.